morning, everyone. And a special morning, a uh, special welcome to Mel and to Carol. Nice to meet you. I haven't met you yet. We'll uh, take a moment to say hello to you after the service. It's lovely to see you. Uh, from our passage today, actually, I was asked to think of something to share from, uh, I think it was going back uh, six weeks ago, and I thought, well, it's around the start of the year. Uh, I know that uh, oftentimes at around the turn of the year, folks like to talk of New Year's resolutions, and so I thought, well, let's just make a twist on that, and let's... Uh, let's give a thought about what a New Year's blessing might look like. A New Year's blessing that our God holds out to all of us as we begin this year. Now that this year is uh, two weeks old, now the 14th. It's the sort of blessing that uh, is good for us to take. In fact, it is necessary for us to take for life and for godliness, for peace with God. And it begins in those first couple of verses that Kay read out for us. Verse 1, if, and if you could jump back to that uh, psalm. Thank you. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Verse 2, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. Now, I've just read those verses out, but I wonder whether it hits to the heart uh, for us this morning. Now, personally, when I think about you know, this, this topic of, or well, let's, let's consider, well, do we want a New Year's blessing or do we want to take on a New Year's resolution? I don't know about you, but for me personally, I'd rather receive a blessing, a New Year's blessing, rather than having to commit to a New Year's resolution. Why? It's because New Year's resolutions need work. It's a New Year's worth of work, right? It's something on top of the usual routines. To get the benefits of a resolution, it means extra focus, it means extra effort, it means a little bit more of ourselves, doesn't it? And there's only so much we can give, is there not? And so friends, I just wanted to get us to think of a question here this morning. What if there was such a thing where we could set a resolution for the year, where we could get all the benefits, not by giving the best of ourselves, but by giving the worst of ourselves, to put in all of the bad and to receive all of the good in return. What if there was a resolution like that? Friends, actually, what I've just said, as strange as it might sound, that is actually the offer that God is giving to you and I this new year. Something that he offers through the words of this psalm that Kay read for us this morning. Psalm 32. We can think of it not as a New Year's resolution that God is commanding us to make, but it's rather a New Year's blessing that God offers us to take from him. So, an offer of blessing for this new year from God in return for, in a sense, us giving God our worst. What does that mean? What is this blessing? Before we get into uh, the passage proper, let me pray for us and ask for God's help. Let's pray. Please join with me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would please open up your words to us. Uh, may you speak through me as I share. May I speak the truth of your word powerfully uh, to each and every one of our hearts and minds. May you uplift our souls and our spirits so that we might be blessed today, blessed into this new year with this very strange blessing and this very strange way of receiving it that you teach us to take this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if I could encourage us, if we've got a paper Bible in front of us, or if you've got the app on your phone, open up to Psalm 32, because as I noticed, as we were reading up on the screen, there are a couple of things that uh, the, the slides actually don't show. For those of us who do have a paper Bible in front of us, Psalm 32, on these Bibles, it's on page 549, page 549. You'll notice that it actually begins with a little subtitle. Psalm 32 of David, a masculine. 
I figure I understand why uh, during the overheads it's dropped that little detail out. Oftentimes people think, oh, it's not really that important to the seeing of a psalm, but it is still the word of God. It is in the text, and so it's important to just take a moment to reflect on this. The psalm is of David, a masculine, whatever that means. Now, whether King David wrote this psalm or whether it's inspired by him, the point is this song, this psalm, is the kind of song that King David would have sung. It's the stuff that's in this song is the stuff that King David would have done in his own personal life, in his walk with God. And for those of us who know his life story, we can really easily imagine situations where this song would have hit very close to home for King David. His sin with Bathsheba and its consequences, for one. And this song sets an example for all of God's people, including us here today. It's an example for us to follow as we trust in our Lord Jesus, who is Lord of King David and is our Lord as well. Now, that, that little word, masculine, there, not quite sure what it means. It's certainly a type of song. It's probably suggesting that it's kind of like a proverb set to music. So you could call it maybe like a wisdom song, masculine wisdom song, something like that. And with the opening words of this song, it's very clear that this wisdom song is about blessing. Now, what is this blessing and what does it take to get it? Let's go back into the psalm from verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. That word transgressions there. Crimes, offences. And being forgiven means to not get that punishment. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Those sins, those failures of ours when we fall short of God's standards. And when those sins are covered, it means that those mistakes and those failures, they are hidden. Verse 2, blessed is the one whose sin, who's falling short, the Lord does not count against them. In other words, blessed are you when the Lord, your maker, your God who is full of perfect justice and judgment, lets you go. <laughs> blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and is in whose spirit is no deceit. In other words, blessed is someone who doesn't lie to themselves. Someone who doesn't lie to themselves and thinks that they're okay when they're not. Blessed is someone who knows that they're not perfect, but who still trusts that the Lord still loves them. To, to sum this up, in other words, blessed are you and me when we put in the bad and we don't get the bad in return. It's the total opposite of what we should expect. And it's something, of course, that's made only possible through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, whom we have remembered in Holy Communion this morning. He was the one who took on the curse of our sin, the penalty for our failure that we might receive blessing from God instead. Friends, do we want this sort of blessing this year? I know I do. It's one that I pray for and lay claim to every day. It's one that I couldn't go one day without. It's that assurance that for me, what it means for me is that in all the close relationships that matter to me, that they're in a good place, especially the relationship between myself and my God. Not necessarily perfect, not necessarily easy. Now those, I was chatting to a few folks here in this side of the hall this morning. You know that uh, for Vinci and me, our morning getting here wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy this morning. Not necessarily perfect, not necessarily easy in relationships, but from the big picture, I can say, at least, that we are at peace with God and peace with those that we are in closest relationship with. 
That is the promise of blessing that God's offering to you and me this morning and every day. It's better than committing to a New Year's resolution, I think. As good as the resolution is, and uh, I'd be quite happy if uh, you, know, you have committed to some resolution this year. I'd love to hear it, actually, after, after the service over morning tea. But this New Year's blessing is better than all of those because it depends on God's goodness and not my own. It depends on God's work, not my work. That is blessing, friends. But to better understand this blessing, it helps to know what the opposite of it is. What is the curse? We get a sense of that as we continue in this psalm. Verse 3. When I kept silent... My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. That's the curse. Keeping silent. No conversation with God, our maker. When we're, when we're full of thoughts, full of ideas and desires and regrets and fears, it's a curse to have no one to share that with. It's a curse to have to keep all of those things to ourselves. Unable to share what's on our heart with the Lord our God. It's a broken relationship with God. That is the curse. How does this broken relationship with God affect you and I and everyone out there in our world today? It could be, it could be a lot of ways to describe this, but the way the psalmist describes it for us in verse 3, it's, it's talking as as though our whole body is just wasting away. Our heart is sick. Not in good relationship with our maker. Not having a clear conscience before God. Receiving from him not blessing, but judgment and curse. Verse 4. That's what it feels like. For day and night... Your hand was heavy on me. Your, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Now we all know a little bit about what that feels like lately with how muggy and how hot the temperature or how uh, the weather has been. Friends, if blessing from God is a constant thing, then so is the curse as well. There's, there's no in-between when it comes to our relationship with God, it's either the one or the other, either blessed or under judgment and curse. Now, share a little bit from myself. Recently, just in a small way, I actually have been not feeling so great. I've been feeling a little bit of those, those two verses, three and four, that, that weight, that, that weariness. Nothing too terrible, just various stresses here and there. Nevertheless, they are, for me at least, just an unpleasant reminder of what it could look like to live under God's curse. It's not nice at all. And friends, I, there may be some among us here this morning where those words of the song might hit close to home as well. Like me, perhaps you can point to a whole host of different pressures and stresses in your life, there might be a bit of a drain at the moment. Things that are common to a whole lot of us include the cost of living constantly going up, uncertainty about health, uncertainty about our jobs, disharmony in relationships. And I'm sure that our psalmist, the person who wrote this song, I'm sure he could have said the same thing in his own life. And there are quick fixes out there, aren't there? You could cut, up that, cut off that relationship. You could abandon your responsibilities. You could turn to alcohol or pornography. You could withdraw from society. You could even withdraw from talking with God. But what this song is teaching and reminding you and I today is that if we want to make some real lasting progress on those stresses and those pressures that are out there, and perhaps some that are in our own hearts as well, if we want to actually make the real progress on those things, the wisest thing to do 
is to get our relationship with God right first. Get our walk with God right first, get that sorted out, and then you can take on the world. We could say, actually, another way to put this is, in order to make good on any New Year's resolution, it's actually wise to first get a New Year's blessing. How can we get this blessing? Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said... I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. So friends, how shall we be blessed? By praying. And on this point, actually, I want to share uh, a lesson that I was reminded of last week. So, so Greg and I uh, were with guys at Six Up, and we were in the cottage next door. One, at one point during our Bible study, the discussion turned to the question of prayer. Is it wrong to pray for all the things that we want, even when we kind of know that they're selfish or trivial or stupid or unrealistic or maybe even sinful? Should I pray for a fancy new chain around my neck? Should I pray for a brand new Lamborghini? Should I pray for a parking space when Westfield is packed full? Those kinds of things. It's a good question to ask, isn't it? For six up, it was those things. Those were the so-called trivial or silly things or even the sinful things that were on their mind. What might be those things for you? What are those things that are on your heart that where you think, uh, I'm not going to pray about that because it's either silly or it's wrong? Now, last week when uh, we were in the six up discussion, I encouraged us to pray with an attitude that says we should just share those things with God anyway. Why? Because he already knows about it. He cares for us. And what it means is there's no use holding back, is there? We might be ashamed about it. We might be embarrassed about it to bring those bad things to God, silly things to God. But God already knows what's on our hearts. What's the use of holding back in our prayers? What's the use of hiding away? It couldn't hurt us to bring them to God, could it? And as I was preparing the message for today, I realized that this this verse was actually the perfect answer that was raised to that question over at Sixer. We should pray to God and acknowledge all the stupid things, all the selfish things. Pray to God recognizing that some of the things that we want are sinful, that they are wicked sometimes, but that we choose to bring them to God anyway. Acknowledge them, confess them all, because we believe that God will do for us what he did for the psalmist. At the end of that verse 5, we believe that God will do for us what he did for him. He says, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Because we have faith that God will love us still and do what is good for us. In other words, friends, Let's bring everything to our Heavenly Father, even the dumb stuff, even the silly stuff, even if it seems unrealistic, even if it seems like a long shot, because our Heavenly Father promises us it will not hurt us to bring those things to Him. In fact, He promises to bless us when we do. That's what confession is. The details of confession, yes, that's a personal business. It's a private business. Those details, they are strictly between you and the person that you need to do business with. The psalmist, for his part, he doesn't give us all the gory details, all the juicy bits of what was going on in his own life. Those details are between the psalmist and God 
alone. Now, that's true in the life of the psalmist. When it comes to confession, it's also true in my own life. You know, I can encourage us to confess all that's on our hearts to God, but I'm not going to share with you everything that's on my heart because it's not going to be helpful, right? It's not necessary, but it is important for us to do that business with God, whatever that might look like. It's important for us to do this, friends, because I want for all of us, God wants for all of us to enjoy his blessing. Therefore, verse 6, Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. This sort of prayer, this sort of confession, where we can hand over to God even all the worst and to seek his blessing because that's really the true way to find real escape from the trouble and distress of our hearts because surely the verse continues surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them this is the sort of prayer which is the way to safety and to comfort and to joy Because if the God of justice is not going to condemn you for bringing him his worst, then no one and nothing else in the world can hurt you either. Verse 7. This is something that we can say because of God's great love for us through Jesus. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Friends, that is blessing. And confessing our sins to God is the way to get it. In a real sense, God's promise to us is that if we give God our very worst by our trust in Jesus, then God is going to give us his very best. Now, at this point in the psalm, the perspective shifts. Whether it's the psalmist speaking or whether it's even God speaking, in any case, Now the song turns to address you and me. Verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Now personally for me, I like to imagine this as, as God speaking, Or even as the psalmist encouraging in the place of God saying, hey, look, speaking on behalf of God, this is what God's word is saying to you. The way that we should go, the way we find it comes from the word of God, that scripture that we have on our phones, on the screens, in our paper Bibles, something we can hold in our hand and read aloud every time we gather together. Uh, for my sake, actually, as I think on this verse, if I could ask during your weeks, if you could pray uh, for everyone who has the privilege of teaching God's word. Uh, pray for me, uh, that God might bless you uh, through uh, my teaching and pray for all your teachers, uh, those who have that opportunity and privilege to teach God's word that God might lovingly guide you in the way that you should go in life. And my prayer for us, all of you, is that as God's word is taught, that we might truly listen and obey it, heeding the warning that is in verse 9. Verse 9 says this, Don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Why is it good to us to have understanding? It's summed up in this one line in verse 10. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Friends, that is a New Year's blessing. And the blessed life is marked out by joy and gladness and song in response. And so the psalm ends like this. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. 
to have a clear conscience before God, a heart that's in a right place, in the right relationship with him. That's the sort of life that God wants to bless you and I with this year, every day, to everyone everywhere, so long as they put their faith in his son Jesus. Let me pray for us now. Please join with me. Let's pray. Let's ask for God's blessing in this way. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise to us in your word this morning from Psalm 32, this promise where we can give you, in a sense, all of the bad that's in us, all of our worst. And yet when we can do that by faith in your Son, Jesus, we can expect to receive from you your very best to have our sins forgiven, to have right relationship with you, our maker, to give us wisdom to then have right relationships with those that we live and work with in this world. Thank you for teaching us how we can receive this blessing. It is something that is achievable by all of us because all of us can pray to you when we pray to you in our hearts with our words and confess to you and acknowledge all of our sins, all the things that we might otherwise be embarrassed or ashamed of, the things that you already know, but you call us to not hide those things and those thoughts from you so that you might bless us. We pray, Lord, that in each of our hearts this morning and every day, that you would teach us to be brave and bold in prayer and even to hand over to you all those things which, are, which may seem to us silly or stupid or trivial or selfish or even sinful. And in return, we trust that you will give us your very best, that you will... Follow through on your promise, promise to us in your word, to teach us the way we should go and to love us always. Help us then, Lord, to live out this truly blessed life with joy, with thanksgiving, with singing, with praise. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.